Hello, let's go over economies of scale. This is a hot idea over in uh, NoCal or NorCal, I guess is what they say. Um, and uh, so it's an uh, interesting idea. People run around uh, Silicon Valley obsessed with this idea of scale, and uh, it comes from economics. So here you go, another way this could make you money. So hey, if you do, uh, if you do hit it big and really successful, remember us at Pima, and uh, we'll build a statue to you if you big donation or whatever anyway so there's a podcast you might like if you're an entrepreneur um it's from the uh the guy that started linkedin and he talks to different entrepreneurs about how they were able to quote scale up uh their their app or their business or whatever so you might enjoy that it's uh at no cost you can listen in your car or whatever all right so uh some of you while you were while i was going over different fixed costs you were thinking well wait a second and the, you know i could change the size of the factory i could build a bigger fi factory i could shut down i could move it somewhere else build a second factory um, change the capital goods and you're absolutely right uh in the short run though uh, there are fixed costs, right? So in the long run, we can change it. But in the short run, we recognize that there are fixed costs. That's the definition of short run in economics is that some of the inputs, some of the costs that we're facing are fixed and I can't change them, right? So there's no real time limit. It's a, it's a number of, um, that has to do with the fixed costs, right? But in the long run, all costs are variable. So long run, remember, write that down, all costs are variable. So over the course of years, I can change the factory, I can invest in capital goods, I can do all kinds of fun things, right? So there you go. This is kind of what I just said. Um, and uh, I encourage you, I, this clip is not um, uh, closed caption, but if you want to go watch it and you don't need the captions, um, you can check it out. It's, uh, it's about dairy and why most dairies in the U.S. Are, are extremely large, right? Why they have, quote, scaled up. Pretty good clip. So let's do a graphical analysis here, and we'll just think through the rest of this. So here's average total cost, or really just price. This is just money up here, and this is quantity, okay? So a firm can choose three factory sizes. They can use small, medium, or large, right? or maybe a dairy. Each of those has a short-run average total cost. That's what we've been doing. Uh, for a while. So this is a short run average total cost curve. Just looks like this U action. At the minimum here you have the uh, productive efficiency or productive scale is what we call that. Um, and so as the firm grows and gets bigger, right, it gets cheaper to produce and then eventually they hit diminishing marginal returns. It gets more expensive to produce. So what should they do when it's really getting more expensive? They should invest in a bigger, more efficient factory. So they do. Right? They do it probably in this example a little bit before they hit that out of control prices. So once once they, they come on over here, they're going to invest in that bigger factory uh, and then produce. Here's the efficient scale for the bigger factory. The bigger factory is much more, well, efficient uh, at this medium-sized factory. And eventually, it gets more expensive to produce the more we produce. So we switch to the, long, the, the large factory. Right? So the large factory, get over here. Not quite as efficient. This should make sense. It's a little harder to run a huge production. Uh, you have more managers to watch. Managers have more employees to watch. More capital goods. More stuff can break. Things are more spread out. So on and so forth. So not quite as efficient in this example. It could be, but it's not in this example. And then eventually it gets uh, more costly out there. Okay. Now, since the firm in the long run could be producing, you know, along this curve, along this curve along this curve, it really makes sense that basically they're all just parts of one long run average total cost. Okay, so they could be producing along any of these. So there's this long run average total cost curve. It's it's not hard. It's, it's just uh, all of the different combinations of short run average total cost curves we could have. Okay, so here's just a million different curves. We could have tons of them. Put them all together, we get this long run average total cost curve. So it's just this one long run cost curve here, and that's what we get. Okay, so why do we care about this? Well, as I can increase my production here, it gets cheaper to produce each unit. Or you could think of it this way um, each additional input unit gives me more of an additional output. So if I have 10% more inputs, I'm going to get more than 10% output. I'm very productive in the cost side, right? So this is economies of scale. Okay, that's the definition. As I produce more quantity, they get they get on average cheaper to produce. Okay, eventually here I get no benefit. Right? This is this is called constant returns to scale. So it's 
staying the same. And then eventually it's starting to get more expensive. We call that diseconomies of scale. Okay, so the first one here, as it goes down, this is going to be the economies of scale, getting cheaper uh, to produce. And this is really good because now it means I can really, you know, uh, sell at a lower price for my competitors. It's a really good thing. Uh, then this is constant return to scale and not really getting any benefit, but you know, it's not getting more expensive either, so that's good. And then finally, diseconomies of scale. The average total cost curve is rising the more that I produce. Okay. So what are some causes? Well, uh, you know, I'm allowed to when I'm able to specialize, right? Each each worker, if I'm a really big firm, I can have uh, greater specialization. Everybody gets the same job. They do it over and over and over again. Adam Smith, all that stuff is great. Um, if I can. Um, you know, move my stuff all around the world. I can knock the, the price down, um, and you know it, it is more common when, when when I have a low quantity. You saw that on the graph, right? But if I can invest in capital machinery, bigger machinery, faster machinery, more efficient machinery, I can I can get these economies of scale. Um, movement of labor. If I can move, uh, or you know, a lot of firms are having people work from home, different countries. They work on projects in different places. They've really been able to, this is why it's so hot in Silicon Valley, they're able to scale up their operation, right? I'm able to transport things, if I'm able to, you know, have a team of scientists uh, you know, devoted to certain things, I can I can do it at a cheaper cost than one one scientist who has to do everything, right? Uh, so you'll see this a lot. This is a couple years ago, Ford, India, to benefit from economies of scale, right? So India has this huge workforce, uh, and Ford is going to try to, or at least they did back then, um, they're gonna they're gonna build uh, these Indian plants to try to build more um, Fords. Okay, on the consumer side, there's a place where consumers benefit from economies of scale. In other words, you you buy a bigger quantity and you get a lower per unit price, which is really a cost to you. It's the flip side, and this is uh, Sam's Club or, or Costco, right? So you might get a might get a lower price per unit, but you have to buy a much larger quantity. People are well aware of that. So you you're actually well aware of this this concept already. From a consumer standpoint, you just apply it to business on the other side. Okay, some people think um, they're great, right? So Walmart benefits from economies of scale. They tell um, producers in in other parts of the world or in the United States, you will buy a billion units at one penny over your marginal cost. And the firm that's ma being made that offer to says, of course, they'd love one billion pennies, right? Uh, and so a, a good one reason that's positive, well, Walmart employs people, uh, lowers the price uh, for people, and it increases their consumer surplus. Two ways that could be negative, well, uh, they don't always, the wages don't always follow, okay, so it might be just funneled back into the capital holders and the shareholders. Uh, another way to look at it is um, it, 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 it might give Walmart some, some market power that uh, would keep out competition, make it harder to get in there and compete, right? So there's two ways to look at it, economies of scale. Uh, diseconomies of scale, um, kind of run into the Dilbert problem, right? They did nothing and got paid uh, the same. So when firms get really big, so the famous story that you should look up in your business studies is GE in the 1980s. They did everything. They still do a lot of things, but they did even more back then. It's just in tons of businesses. Their CEO at the time, Jack Welsh, he, he takes over the company and he says, nope, we're experiencing diseconomies of scale. I don't know that he used that exact term, but he uh, did definitely what he said. He said, oh, if we're not number one or number two, we're cutting it loose. Okay, so he got rid of all the sunk costs. He was called Neutron Jack. He would walk into a building and it'd be like a neutron bomb went off. And uh, he, he made GE more efficient, got way away from these diseconomies of scale. Uh, and GE is able to be the company that they are today. Okay, and uh, And that's it for economies of scale.